The thing is, is that I think people buy from people. And so unless you have a major brand, like you understand branding and you're able to give so much money behind you and create all this extra stuff, you want to create a storyline that goes with your business. So people are rooting for you as a small business owner and they're attached to your story or the story of why you've created this business more. So it's going to be that too, because it's going to make their lives better. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Welcome back to the Gold Digger Podcast, Jacqueline. Thanks for having me on and you are welcome. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You were on the show this time around last year, but in case some of the business owners haven't heard it yet, can you share a little bit about who you are, what you do and how you got to where you are? Yes. (laughs) It's like, can I wear my wallet? Yeah. And so I ran that company for you know, a good like three years, we sold globally the 60 different stores. Kim Kardashian wore it. We had, um, Audrina Patridge of the Hills. Like it was very popular back then. Carrie Underwood wore it on the uh, video music awards and in her, one of her music videos. So I was getting a ton of, this is when celebrities mattered (laughs) in the way of it was pre-influencer time. And so I'd done this and I'm like an expert in that. And then if you all haven't heard, but I co-founded this company with Mina, who is my business partner, and we've recently, we're still friends, but we've recently transitioned. Mina decided to step down from her position at the product boss, and I am leading the way. So it's really exciting um, and bittersweet. But what we did is when we first met, we realized that I had an established understanding of startups, how to start a business, and also the idea of multiple streams of revenue. So whenever I looked at other product businesses, I said, you know, they're distributed in a lot of different ways. And so what we actually did is we created a course for this. We have a podcast called The Product Boss. And so all of my years of knowledge, you know, when you look back now that I'm in my 40s and I have hist, I'm like, oh, I could look at 20 years and have data. Yes, yes. <laughs> I was like, everything led me to today. So launching all of these different product businesses, having a couple of my own being a service business, it led me to the place where now I could speak to product-based business owners worldwide and service people who want to add product to their business. And um, yeah, and now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here. That's amazing. Okay. As you're talking, I'm already thinking of like, okay, I should partner with Jacqueline and like, what if we made gold digger sweatshirts or mugs or things like that? Like, I think there are so many entrepreneurs that are listening that are in the digital space or the service-based business industry and they haven't considered products. So what is your like stance for products? Like why products sell it to me? Like we're on Shark Tank. Okay. So I want to just quickly say your customers don't want to buy swag. So as much as I love this idea, we, this we can good. workshop okay. it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's workshop it live on air. Okay. okay. So the idea here is that, you know, if you think about it and we all have that swag that people give us with the name of their company and what do we do with it? We probably sleep in it donate or it. go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> or donate it. So yeah, you know, or donate. Exactly. <laughs> like those mugs, like I can't take another mug because I am so specific about my mug covered. Right. Yep. So when we think about swag, your customers do not want to exchange their cold, hard cash for your swag. They'd love to get it and they'd appreciate it, but that's not the thing that they want to buy. So I think, you know, Jenna, especially for you, let's say you decided that you wanted to start some sort of product arm as a revenue stream for your business. I would first think about why. So is it for community, like community engagement for people to feel a part of a community? Is it a solution to a problem that they have? Or is it something that's in alignment with who you are, like whether it's on social or your podcast. So I will tell you, you do a very good job at the alignment part, because if you look at the products that you're an affiliate of, you sell physical products and you sell service products. And that's an alignment with when people follow you from a personal level, they're like, Jenna, what makeup are you using? What are you, you know, what's in your smoothie? You know, what's, what, what, um, software do you use? Mm-hmm. like HubSpot, which we both use. So yeah. <laughs> that's just a plug for the network we're on. Um, so that's what I think first to think about is like the why you would want to add product into your business. I mean, D all of the above, but I, I okay. love, I love when I trust somebody and I know that they are in integrity so that whatever it is that they're selling, it's going to be the best of the best. Mm-hmm. So I think when you're thinking about it and you know, where you were kind of going like, let's do some gold digger swag, right? We could probably approach it in a different way and think about, is there something that I always want us to think, is there like a need, want, desire, or a problem that we can solve? So do you, you, we, you probably follow Sarah Blakely of Spanx yes. and she's constantly Love drinking her. her mug. She has those mug yes. pictures. Yes. Right? 
if she had like a really specific mug, I know I said I didn't want any mugs, but let's just say though, <laughs> Sarah Blakely sold me a mug, but let's say it said something on it. Like Sanira, um, uh, CEO school, she does this yep. really well. She has one that says like nothing bad happens when women make money, Yeah, but it's a cute cup too. Yeah. Yep. Right. And so that to me is like merch that your customers want and it can be less. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it's something that maybe they're seeing you use a lot and they're like, I want one of those too. And they would be willing to part with their hard earned money, you know? And I think that's a really great thing that people can think of and add on, especially if they have an audience thinking about something like that. And if you did do something like that, um, there are really easy ways to get that going as well. Okay. So let's, let's talk about some of the products you've seen come to life so we can kind of span some of the genres. Cause maybe people are like, I don't want to make a mug or I don't want to do yeah. a sweatshirt. What are some of the different products that you guys have seen running the product boss? I feel like you've probably seen every category out there. Every category out there. <laughs> like no joke. So do you want me to talk about this from the service side or from the, like becoming any a side, any, any side. side. Okay. Well, when we think about solving like a need, want, desire, or solving a problem, for example, we have a couple students, they're, they're owners. He was a youth pastor, but also super creative. And they created this company called Dome Doc. And he, it's the hat rack reinvented. So Ooh. they started off on Etsy, for example, and he was carving. I always like to say like John was out back like whittling wood, <laughs> creating a hat rack that's – it's basically like this shape that goes on your wall that you can stack all your hats up on. He, they saw a problem in the market. And they realized nobody, where do we put all our hats? And they created this invention. And so we coached them and they were our students through the pandemic when everything shut down from a manufacturing perspective, he could still make them out of wood, but we needed to figure out how to transition them into project product and like uh, injection molds. And in their year after that, again, he was a youth pastor. He can't even believe it, but they made a million dollars in their first year. Now they're making two to $3 million a year. And like a couple of years later, He's inventing another product category. They're just, they're, they're living this incredible life. They bought their truck in cash. They're building a ranch, you know? So I love to say that you don't necessarily need a huge product suite or a collection. Mm. It can also be a solo product idea. Then, so that's an invention. Um, I've also seen people. So for example, um, Annika of Hay Mavens, she goes for body inclusive lingerie, but really cute body inclusive laundry. So she's a fashion designer. She has more of a collection, but she has bright colors. Um, think like rainbow, every color of the rainbow, you can get these really cute, like high-waisted underwear and bra, um, plus other stuff. And so she is more of a designer and she's come out with something, but she's niche, right? What do people yeah. need, want, and desire? They desire to be beautiful, feel sexy, whatever their feeling is. And then she's solving a problem for them. Well, she's meeting a need, a desire, and she's also solving a problem of having body inclusive lingerie, for example. Yeah, love that. What would you say? So I feel like products just feel intimidating because you start thinking about all the things that go into products. So it's like having the idea, getting it made, selling it, shipping it, customer service. Like, I just feel like there are so many barriers to entry. So why would somebody want to go into the product space? <laughs> Such a good question. <laughs> Well, I think there's twofold, right? There's, there's people who makers, they say makers got to make, and I always like to say makers got to make money, yeah. right? So there's this desire to create a physical, tangible good in the world. And we can think about all the obstacles, but you know, when I think about when I started my business back in the day, or my mom was my original product boss. So she was even before that. When I talked to her about why she didn't grow her business, she said it was overwhelming. It was intimidating. She had five kids. She was a mom. She wanted this as a side hustle. And she didn't have Etsy at that point. She didn't have sales channels and sales platforms. And we teach about these in our program that could do so much of the work for you. So you really just need to figure out what do I want to make? Like what's needed in the market? Um, you need to get it made or source it, for example. And then we have so many platforms now, even, you know, building an e-commerce site, so many things are solved for you. When I had my e-commerce site, I had to like find API codes and like link like this to that. And you know, everything was disjointed. And now we have really awesome software. And then we also have software and shipping that makes it really easy. So you, my friends, just need to figure out what are you going to make? We need to price it correctly. We need to make the product. We need to grow the audience and have the audience there to buy it from us. Software is going to take over and then you just need to ship or fulfill. And I think in the very beginning, I see so many of our students, they do it themselves because it's really exciting. 
when yeah. you get the orders yeah. and you're packing and shipping. And then you can grow. You can hire people. You can get a fulfillment company. So I wouldn't let those things really get in the way if you really want to grow a beautiful business. Are there ways, like, do you recommend people testing out their idea or making sure that people are actually willing to purchase it before they go too far in the wrong direction? Because I can see that fear of like, I have this idea, but I have no idea if people are going to want to buy it or if it's like a viable option. What would you say for people that are questioning that? Yeah, it's such a good, good question. And it's true because like I told you, I'm a startup expert. I've started so many brands and, you know, we got hit with this a lot during the pandemic where... I was working one-on-one -on -one with a client and she was sourcing her fabric from Italy, which was one of the first places to shut down. And she was having it manufactured in China, which was also obviously shut down. And so we had this huge delay. And so what I really think for all of you is this idea of validation. Like you can do product validation and there's ways to do this. And I teach this in our program. There's ways to validate the product or grow an audience without having it ready. So for her, for example, she was doing equestrian clothes for teens, and, well, actually tweens. So they were like, they weren't ready for the grown-up stuff, but then they, they didn't want to wear the little kid equestrian clothes anymore. Yeah. And so we just started posting and creating content that was needed by them. Um, we would highlight and share other tweens that were doing really well in the equestrian space and posting um, you know, quotes and things like that that they would share. She built this beautiful audience before she ever spent a dollar on production. So she knew, ah, oh, there is a need in the market. But you need to be able to have the idea of like marketing, building this audience and testing something aligned with them to see if it really makes sense. And if you can't do that or you're not going to build it that way, the other thing is, is you can also come up with these ideas and then interview people that would be your ideal customer. Mm -hmm. And so don't make it your family and friends because they're going to be like, great idea. Yeah. Yes, of Jenna, make those shirts. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you want to talk to your ideal customer and say, would you yeah. pay me for this? And then I think that's a great way to validate before you actually step into making it. I love that. I also just think too, it's like really easy for people to say like, of course I would buy that. And then the minute you're like, okay, give me your credit card. They're like, wait a minute. And so I think that validation piece is not only important just for viability of seeing a profit, but also for your confidence of like, this is an actual problem that I'm solving, or this is a solution, or this is something that will bring people joy that they're willing to invest in. I think that's really powerful as an entrepreneur, especially in the product business space because it is a little bit more intensive in the front end to get a product to viability and for sale. So let's talk marketing. You were kind of already hinting at marketing. We are, we are navigating some of the loudest marketing seasons of the year from the holidays to the new year. It is that time where it feels like everyone and their mom is shouting and your messages might not be received. What is working for marketing in the product business space right now? Yeah. So the thing is, is that you want to have a clear offer, right? So I think if you know who your customer is and you know what their problem is and their problem can also be a desire, right? Mm. I desire to feel a certain way, to appear a certain way, to be something you need. If you tap into what their problem is and you then give them a solution with your product and it's super key. So when you sell to everyone, you're selling to no one. When you're yeah. marketing to everyone, you're marketing to no one. So stop trying to sell your stuff and say, everyone can use this. Let's get really specific. And then when we think about the seasons, whether it's the holiday season, which it's a lot of gift giving, right? They're, they're scrambling. They're trying to figure out what to buy. When do I buy it? Who's it for? You make things really specific. That's why, you know, during the Christmas season, we always see gift guides, right? Yeah. Here's my gift guide because it's yep. solving a problem. I have so many gifts to buy. What am I going to buy? So I think when you think about that, um, when we move into like the new year, like you said, we have to just tap in what is their biggest problem? What is their biggest obstacle? And how can my product and your product can also be your service, right? Or yeah. your course or whatever it yeah. is. How does this solve a problem? Um, I once saw with somebody, she's actually in photography and she would do family photography. And she said, if I shot a family and they had two sons and then I marketed that inevitably, the people who would book with me would have two sons. So you want to show the people you want to come by from you. So I think if you're really honed in, you niche down, you make a really good, clear offer. And I also don't want people to overdo things. It doesn't need to be like, go back, look through all your Black Friday emails from like yes. commerce stores, because we all have yes. them in our inbox now. Don't delete your inboxes, like keep this for data. <laughs> yep. 
And then look and see what graphics did they do? What offer did they do? A lot of times it's not like some amazing photo shoot with your products and models and stuff like that. It's like a clear graphic that says 30% off site-wide. Yep. And that's what they need to see. So I think don't overthink it, but be really specific and it would work. Yeah. I love this. We have a folder in my Gmail where anything that actually gets me to open it and or click on it, I save. Cause I'm like, this caught my attention enough for me to open it. This got my attention enough to buy it and, or to like click more. Cause those are the two biggest things. Open rates and click through rates are the two biggest things for email marketing. So pay attention to what is actually catching your attention. Cause there's a good chance there's like 20 emails in your inbox and you're only opening one or two of those. What does that look like? And what does it take to do that? And so we have a folder in my Gmail where anything that I do that on, I just slide it in there. Cause then I can study it and be like, Oh, that caught my attention or that subject line was like fascinating to me or whatever that is. And I think that can be super powerful. And then Another thing that was popping into my brain, Jacqueline, as you were talking about getting hyper specific is you can split test so much of this as well on platforms like Pinterest, where you could say like equestrian clothing for tweens, or you could say like the perfect outfit for your tween that horseback rides or whatever it is. And like, you can try all these different things to see what is resonating the best. And same with ads, you could actually have the same product targeted to specific segments of your audience with very clear copy saying, you know, this is the book that all teachers need. And then this is the book that all photographers need. And then this is the book that all moms need. And it could be the same product, but when you get so crystal clear on that targeting, it makes people take action so much quicker and with more confidence. And you want a confident buyer. You don't want a confused buyer. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and it's knowing who you're selling to. Like if we yep. don't know who we're selling to, there's, we're not going to get the results that we want. So I think when you're really clear, and like you said, you could split test and you could say tweens or 12 year olds, right? You yep. can choose different language and different images and see what they're clicking on. Yes. I love that. Okay. So walk me through, because something I think a lot of us talk about is like having multiple streams of income, right? Like we all are talking about diversifying, especially with the economy. Why is it important that we have multiple streams of income? Yeah. Well, again, if the last few years have taught us literally anything, <laughs> right? Be we never prepared. thought that. Yeah. We never, and you know, it's, it's a good learning lesson. We never thought Amazon would shut down. And if we all remember, you know, at some point Amazon was only selling essential items. Um, Etsy can easily close and shut down people's stores for whatever reason they decide to do it. Um, in person shut down, you know, markets were closed. Meta went down for a day, mm -hmm. right? I remember everyone was freaking out. Meta was down. I was like, if you have an email list, send yes. an email because they're yes. so bored. They'll open their emails. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know? So we all think about it. And if you're fully reliant on one stream of revenue, if something happens, if the faucet gets turned off, you're kind of dead in the water. Yep. And so it doesn't mean you have to have equal faucets on, right? Not every revenue stream is going to be as strong, but you have something to fall back on. You know, in yeah. the product space, we talk about this because so many of our students are Etsy sellers. Etsy is one of the easiest things to get on. We don't teach Etsy, but I think you've said this, like, um, and I know it's like a long, but like you can't build on borrowed land, yeah. right? And so the concept here is if you're building on someone else's sales channel, you don't have control if something happens. So I yeah. really like the idea of obviously building an email list of having your own Shopify site or some sort of site, whether you're selling through ClickFunnel, I'm not going to like promote all the people, but like whatever yeah. platform <laughs> you're selling on. And so you have that and you have your email address. And so you're able to contact your customers and say, come buy from me. But the cool thing about other revenue streams is you're getting in front of other people's audiences. Yeah. So whether you're on Amazon or you're selling wholesale and you're on the shelves of other people's stores, whether you're doing an affiliate promotion and you're getting in front of their customers, right? The idea of other people's audiences, that's a way that if you have the product, you yep. can multiply your revenue streams coming from different places. So if something does get turned off or something starts to not perform as well, you have somewhere else that you've started to build or you've built beautifully. Cause I'll see students, um, like for example, dome doc, they had started with ads. No, they started with Etsy. Then they went to, uh, we teach without ads. So they went to Shopify and then they decided to add on Amazon. 
So imagine now making a million dollars on Shopify, a million dollars on Amazon from one product in two colors. I mean, it's amazing, amazing. right? Yeah. 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 (laughs) That's so crazy. So what would you say? Because, you know, you teach about having these multiple streams. Who can do that? Like, especially when we're talking about navigating into the product space, like who are the best candidates for adding products as the business or a stream of the business? Yeah. So what I love is if you, you start with one platform that you become good at, or yeah. you, you have proof of products. So it's sort of like you said, minimal viable product. And then we test it. Are people willing to exchange their money for that? And you can choose which sales channel that is initially. So whether you're going to do it yourself, through your own Shopify site, and you're going to promote people to come there and then, um, they're going to convert and buy great. Whether you're doing it on, um, TikTok shops or Instagram shops, whether you're deciding to do it on Etsy or Amazon or something like that, I want you to have proof of product. And we talk about the bestseller formula. So being known for something, right? The, the, um, 80, 20 rule, for example, 80% yep. of your revenue can come from 20% of your products. So you don't need 2000 products. I'm telling you some of my lives, people are like, I have, you know, 450 SKUs. And I'm like, nobody wants to go through 450 SKUs. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I think when you establish like this, this initial stream of income, so whether you're coming into the space, it's knowing how do I navigate a new sales channel, right? We teach this in our program, multi-stream machine, where we talk about Uh, we talk about different platforms or sales channels that you can easily get on that have no gatekeepers, which means you're not going to get stuck, stopped, or, or let's say kicked off the platform necessarily like Etsy does. And what I'd love for people to do is they think about what their offer is, what their product is. And we have a lot of people that join before they've ever started a business because I told you I've launched a thousand brands yeah. and people will come to me with their ideas and like, I want to make this, I want to make that. And once we knew who their ideal customer is, once we niche down, I'm like, but how are you going to sell it? Yeah. And they're like, well, you know, I'm going to sell it on Instagram. Okay. Well, where's the if audience? If I or build it, it, they will Shopify. come Jacqueline. <laughs> they will not. They will not come. <laughs> they will not. They won't come. So how do we get them to come? Yeah. And so We teach this in the program, right? We teach about how to kind of grow this audience, but one of the easiest ways is to get in front of other people's audiences. So whether you're doing that in partnership, right? Partnership, Amazon, six out of 10 households have Amazon Prime. They're putting it in front of millions and millions of people. Or if you're gonna sell on your own Shopify site, for example, and then we teach about partnerships and affiliates with other brands or um, influencers or you know, whatever that is. And I love wholesale for this reason too, because you just have to have intimate connections with your wholesale partners and then they have the customers and they put it on the shelves and their customers will buy. So I think it's finding which one aligns best with the kind of business you want to build, the kind of product you want to make. And then in the program, we're like, here's the one to start on. And then when you're ready, let's open up other multiple channels. So if you're scaled already, let's say you have listeners that are already selling, multi-stream machine is also amazing. We had a $4 million Etsy business join the program because she had 4 million eggs in one basket. Yeah. Right. And so she came over to us cause she's like, I need to have eggs distributed in more baskets just in case something happens. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's wild. Um, so when we're thinking about the product space and getting into it or scaling it, what are the biggest challenges that people experience? I have thrown out all of the objections inside of my brain, but what do you think people don't understand about the product business space, both the good and the bad? Because I think there's so yeah. much benefit here. There is. I think one big problem is that spaghetti at the wall yes. sort of yes. thing. So I'm going to make everything because if I make everything, somebody will buy something. Yes. It's not true. Yep. You're going to spend so much of your hard-earned money or savings making all the things and trying to sell all of it. I have these like bags in my office. It's actually here. They're like bags with a dollar sign on it. And yeah. I'm like literally all the product on your shelf is your cash sitting on the shelf not being sold. So it does cost money to start a product business. There is always going to be a startup cost versus when you start service, you kind of just need to get yourself there yep. and do it. 
And I've started, like I said, so many businesses that you can do it with. When I started mine, I did it with all of my savings. And I was, you know, my 20s. So it was like 20 grand. Yep. But there's ways to test and try. There's ways to kind of test things. And so many of our people are makers. So they'll go start with something and do a small batch of candles. Yeah. Or they'll go to get some beads and they'll make some beads and necklaces. So there's the startup costs. Then I think one of the things is, is staying niched. I know your creative minds want to make everything. You're like, well, people are really loving my necklaces. So I'm going to make earrings and bracelets and toe yes. rings. Yes. <laughs> yes. All the things. You have to control your creative urges yeah. and say, what are people buying? And I'm going to make more of those. I love that. And then a big thing I hear people say is that they're introverts and that they don't want to show their face on camera because they're introverts. And I just want to, as an extrovert that also didn't feel comfortable showing my face initially, that's a confidence thing. That's a courage and confidence thing. It's introvert and extrovert is energy, yep. right? Like where do you get your energy? So yeah, you may schedule something and then need to go lay down after versus me. I'm like, let's record 10 podcasts after, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? But the thing is, is that I think people buy from people. Yep. And so unless you have a major brand, like you understand branding and you're able to give so much money behind you and you can create all this extra stuff, you want to create a storyline that goes with your business. So people are rooting for you as a small business owner and they're attached to your story or the story of why you've created this business more. So it's going to be that too, because it's going to make their lives better. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say? So here's my random question. So if somebody is listening to this and they have two ideas, one is like mm -hmm. the idea that they are like wildly passionate about, like this thing that they just like keep thinking about. And the other one is something that maybe they're not as passionate about, but they could like get it off the ground and running a lot faster, like lowest hanging fruit type thing. What would you tell them to do first? Lowest hanging fruit or the thing they're most passionate about? I feel like most passionate about because it's going to get hard yeah. It, and you're going to need to hold on to your why. Right. Yes. I think Jamie Kern Lima talks about this too. She's like when it was the darkest days and they were running out of cash, she needed to stick with it. And if you have your greater why, like why she came up with that product, yeah. it was the thing that gets you through the hard times. So sure. If you want to, if you all just want to go make up, make some quick cash, yeah. there are people that will teach you how to do that. And they'll say like, here's how you source a product, get it up and sell. I've seen a lot of people in my space doing that. And that's for people who are really like cash or revenue driven. Yeah. I think the people who listen to my podcast, that listen to your podcast are very like creative and heart centered. Yeah. And they're thinking about the problems in the world and how can they solve them with it, whether it's their products or their services. So if that is more you, then I would for sure make sure you're deeply passionate about the thing you're about to yeah. build and make. I love that. I agree too. Cause I'm like, especially from a branding standpoint, like we talk so much about the difference between a business and a brand. A business is a product service or offer that's for sale. And the brand is the personality. And I think a lot of times it can be tempting to like make the easy thing or like try the easy thing. And, and I think that would be right for the people who just doubt their belief to follow through. Like if you just need proof that this is a real thing and that like, it could be a real thing for you, like go out and do that easy thing have a stranger buy it one time and prove to yourself that this is a viable opportunity for you. But I do agree that like the passion, the connection, the authenticity behind it is going to keep you tethered to the why. Because I recently heard someone say that was like, if you need to heal yourself, start a business, AKA like your business is going to reveal all the areas that you struggle, whether it's confidence or doubt or self-belief or self-worth or money mindset or whatever it is. When you are an entrepreneur, it exposes every part of you. And I do believe that like when you have that deeper why, that deeper meaning on those days where you're questioning everything, it keeps you a lot more tethered to the idea and why it matters. Yeah. I, I, I love that. It's true. And I, I actually don't think I ever did as much self-work until I started a business. And then when we hit our first million dollars, I was like, I need my life coach more versus yeah. less because sometimes yeah. like holding that, right? Like holding that abundance. So, um, I totally agree. You know, one of the things I got, we have, um, a free Facebook group right now that we're, we're running cause we're kind of testing out some things and it's called the make something and sell it, um, group. Now I saw two posts recently and kind of leading with what you're saying, you know, one woman posted and she goes, just make something she said and sell it. She said, <laughs> So 
she's feeling. like, finally, she like she created a prototype. And yeah. then there's another woman that posted. She did these like little elf on a shelf, and she said, in the past, she had perfectionist tendencies, right, and putting herself out there and like really like. She couldn't move forward because she was such a perfectionist, but she said, based on like listening to our podcast, joining our challenges, she is a multi-stream machine student. She decided she's like, okay, I've got this idea. And so all she had to do is she posted it on her Facebook page and she's like, immediately someone commented, said they wanted it. Then a couple other people did it. And then she was making a custom one for people. She's, she has like 30 kits she's created and she's already sold a third of them in like two days. So it gets exciting when you start to prove it. And so I don't want anyone to overthink it or be a perfectionist. It's like, let's just put it out there. Let's test and try. No one knows you failed, but like no one knows how many you sold. Yeah. Right. You can just stop talking about it and then move on. Yes. Oh my gosh. I mean, in my book, I tell the story about my watercolor painting and I would paint these designs just as a project to like fix my burnout from photography And then I would just post the paintings because I told myself I'm going to sit down every single day and just paint for 20 minutes a day just to calm my nervous system. And then people are like, how do I buy that? How do I get that? Where do I get that? And it's like you can start to see. And I think that there is so much power in like showing the journey and just like letting people in on the aspects of your life that excite you that you're curious about because I think that also might be a great way to figure out what is in alignment? What am I passionate about? What is this idea? What could I create? And I love that. Okay. Okay. You have talked about multi-stream machine. What is this? Why do people need it? Who is it for? Tell me more about it. Yeah, it is. You know, it's our our signature program that literally what's funny is when we first started, it started on this as a panel that I hosted for the fashion industry in L.A. where I had a a group of people, an Amazon expert, a direct-to-consumer expert, a wholesale expert, and we were talking about the fashion industry and how when we look at our most successful companies out there, Let's think about like Nike. You can buy it from someone else's store. You can buy it from their store. You can buy it online. You can buy it through social. They're everywhere. And so this concept was like kind of the initial concept like seven years ago. And then we created this program because like I said before, so many of us are stuck with one stream of revenue or maybe not even our first stream of revenue. And while there are some platforms you can build on, you can get on quickly, the idea here is, is like scalability. So let's say I fully believe when we teach this in the program that you could be making at least, and you should be making at least $2,000 a month with a product business. I don't care what you sell. I don't care what the price point is, which is because I believe it can be that size business. So we get you there first if you're not there. A lot of people are past that. They're already making a couple thousand, 5,000, 10,000. Like I said, we had a $4 million business going in, in there. And then at that point, we're thinking about scaling. So what I want you all to think about is like, what are the, how do I get more eyes on my business? How do I get more customers to know I actually exist? And then how do I sell to them at the exact same time? Mm -hmm. And so the program teaches a scalability of one main platform, but then adding on additional platforms so you can be like Dome Doc, right? Or when I talked about Hey Mavens, the body inclusive lingerie, she sells direct to consumer. She sells through Instagram, but she also opened a retail shop, right? And so I've seen people go from couple hundred dollar months or a couple thousand dollar months. And within the first 30 days of being in the program, they've made their money back and more. Or I know with Annika, for example, she joined, she had her highest month ever was $1,200. She joined and then she was having $12,000 months. I also have a student that she had a full-time job. She had this really cool idea for um, hairspray that's anti-static. She was trying to sell on her own platform. She's trying to get people out there. She's got lots of products. She joined Multi-Stream Machine. In the first 90 days of being in there, she made $31,500 off of one product, okay, which is bonkers because we all think we have to make all the things. Yeah. She quit her job within the first six months. She's going to make $200,000 in the first year. She's like, I've blown my salary out of the water. So there are coaches out there and there are experts out there that teach you one platform only. And if that resonates for you, awesome. But I fully believe, especially when people are trying to build this holistic business that integrates with their life, they have a passion, they have a creativity, they want to solve a problem for their customers, the idea of being multi-channel, and even though we do teach a little bit of social in there, you can do it all without social. Like everything we teach, like you do not have to dance on Instagram or TikTok, and we will help you get in front of audiences, build your list, and do all the things, and you can do it without social too. 
I love that. I mean, I want my listeners to think about this in the sense of like, when you have multiple streams, whether it's of revenue or multiple channels, it's basically like different levers you can pull. And if you don't have multiple levers in your business that allow you to kind of figure out where is this traffic traffic coming from and how is it converting into actual sales and how is that sales turning into profits, this is a really great wake up call of like, this needs to be on your to-do list, especially as you enter into the new year to figure out how to expand and increase the amount of levers in your business so that if anything changes, if any platform shift, you're not out, like you're not down and out. Like, in fact, you're just transitioning the way that you're moving through your business. And, you know, we've taught this for so many years on just different platforms of like, don't, you don't own anything. So like your stake in there is still valuable, but you have to understand the bigger picture. And I think what you're teaching Jacqueline is the bigger picture, especially for people curious about product-based businesses or established product-based businesses. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen lives transformed. It's, it's insane, right? Like I'm sure when you started yours too, I, I didn't know about the impact we would have and the impact we would have on, you know, families and, and the thing that they've been able to do is they're not burning out. They're learning how to build a sustainable business yeah. with multiple revenue streams. Right. Yeah. And so it's worked. And what's amazing is we proved it worked during the pandemic when things were weird. Yeah. And so we saw businesses made, I mean, we just helped a pacifier company pacifiers, right? They hit a million dollars within the first 10 months of starting their business using what we teach in the program. And it's like a sister, you know, and so it's a sister uh, duo and they had had, you know, they've been building it. They had had this business for seven years before they found us. And that's what happened within 10 months. And I want everyone to hear, like, I'd love for you all to have million dollar businesses, but you have your gas, your foot on the gas. You choose what size business you want to have and what's most aligned. But I know that we can help you turn your passion into a paycheck, right? And become a profitable business. Like that is the key word to everything here. Yes. I love that. Where can people find out more about you, about the product boss and about multi-stream machine? Amazing. So we are at the product boss everywhere you follow, and you can also um, listen to our show. So just kind of hop over, search the product boss and follow our show so you can get more info. And then we're going to have a link to the productboss.com slash gold digger. And then you can find out more about multi-stream machine there. Um, and we're going to have a special offer for all of our gold digger listeners. So there's going to be $500 off with a normal investment into the program if you decide to come on in for that because we know that you how how do I say this my entire life's mission has been to make sure that women especially can make their own money so that they can have opportunities they can have options and then make these opportunities that we'd never feel stuck and so I know that this program is a thing if you have a physical product based business if you want to start one even if you're a service based and you want to launch product because I want to overcome those like roadblocks. I want you to do this faster and I do not want you to lose or waste money. So come take a look and I hope that we can support you in this program. It's like the, the most awesome, amazing group too that we have in there. They're just all about lifting each other up. So I think you're going to feel right at home. That's amazing. The productboss.com slash gold digger. Go check it out. I am so excited uh, to have you back on the show. Thank you for coming back on. I My wheels are turning for my idea. I don't know what it'll be yet, but you better believe you're going to get a call from me if and when I have one. Um, I just loved this conversation. Thank you so much for coming back on the show, Jacqueline. Thank you for having me. Our Western way is we need more than 24 hours in a day. Come on, I can get 28. And I don't know, the, the, the math is they're just not giving more. It's 24. So we can play with daylight saving time all we want. We got 24 hours a day. All right, so we got a lot of things that we want to maintain and keep in the black, so to speak. For me, it's it's a career, it's it's it's, it's family, it's health, it's relation with God, 